Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for your time today, or morning in, in Brisbane, Australia, anyway. Um, I'm Mark Palmer, as the, as the slide said, and I'm the uh, general manager of uh, uh, product um, management and marketing for MST Global. Um, I just wanted to uh, sort of give you um, a, uh, a brief overview of who MST Global is, um, as you know, we're a supplier um, to the industry. Um, so as an overview, we're designers and manufacturers of um, digital platforms, uh, supporting digital transformation in minds. And we have a long history providing um, software that brings together the um, hardware systems uh, to deliver the uh, connectivity and productivity um, and safer environments for our mining customers. Uh, so we, we started in 1989 um, uh, after a, uh, a particular, uh, particularly bad incident at a mine um, in Australia, and we could see that there was a, a communications challenge there that we felt that we could solve, uh, and that really started uh, the um, culture, if you like, within the business. So um, we focused almost exclusively um, on underground, um, not exclusively, but almost exclusively, and uh, we're OEM independent. Uh, so uh, we, our aim is to, to be able to connect with as many things as we possibly can. Um, and because we deal with the whole industry, um, our solutions have to be scalable and of course uh, be reliable and flexible. Um, and we have over 300 customers around the globe using our products. So uh, we do have um, uh, some, some good uh, experience in this area. Um, so I wanted to really talk to you today about uh, preparing uh, for this digital environment and it uh, it was a great introduction from Peter really and uh, around um, the flexible approach that they're taking to uh, the needs of um, automation I guess in the main within their minds and Peter talked about these evolving technologies and um, which really is a perfect thread for me because that's exactly where uh, my mind is when we come to this particular opportunity. So sort of going back to the basics um, of the, the problem that we're trying to solve, um, the scope of the exercise is really quite broad um, and it includes network hardware which is obviously something that people focus on but it also involves the software uh, that would overlay that um, infrastructure. And uh, we need to look at the sort of potential interconnectivity um, of systems, how long we need this uh, solution to be relevant. Um, and during this time, what sort of stages of the mind's life cycle are likely to occur? And this really sort of comes back, I guess, to some of the comments around sort of returns on investment and, um, and how we justify uh, investment in these kinds of um, systems. So when we look at the scope of the exercise, it's very broad, but the deliverables perhaps are just as broad and can include some key areas uh, such as communications capabilities and techniques, um, data collection, decision making, um, enhancing or enabling safe practices, visualization of, of our systems, of our um, operations, um, and how do we effectively get that efficiency which gives us the profitability so um, and that of course includes automation so um, there's very diverse goals here but um, at a business level they kind of work um, as well as they do from a technical level. So of course underground mining uh, gives us some um, some unique challenges and uh, I think that uh, one of the key things to remember is that uh, although we may be miners during uh, during the daytime for the rest of the time or sorry for your shift for the rest of the time with people on the surface and so there are things that we take for granted uh, on the surface that can be very difficult or impossible to achieve um, when we're underground so our basic senses uh, are restricted um, it's not always possible to be physically present um, and often you'd need to be in two places at once anyway, even if it was. Um, and our environment is harsh um, for high-end uh, electronic equipment. Um, so although these technologies um, can exist quite happily um, in the above ground scenario, 
uh, once they get underground, they're subject to um, to conditions that maybe the designer hadn't really intended for them to uh, be subjected to. So looking, I guess, more specific first instance in the hardware platforms, um, the in a, it, the components of a hardware system, they really need to be in, in a mine ready package, as I said, um, and it needs to be able to provide a link uh, from the underground uh, to the surface uh, and back again, obviously. So these things never work in isolation or shouldn't work in isolation. It really needs to provide the communications backbone. Um, to connect all operation, all elements of the operations together. So um, people, machines and vehicles all need to be able to interact and be interconnected um, by this digital platform. When we look at the need for data, it's unlikely to diminish going forward. So the platform's got to be able to provide for the data handling um, needs of today, but also what's our data needs for the future and, and who can really know what that looks like. But we can be sure that um, the need for data and the conversion of that data to information is going to get more and more, um, more and more difficult to, to deal with. Um, it's also really got to be capable of integrating with current and emerging technologies and practices. And this is, I think, one of the things that sort of struck me with Peter's um, uh, Peter's presentation there was just how many elements have to come together to produce the whole solution for the mine. And of course, because we're in a competitive industry, um, our, any investment we make needs to work as hard as we possibly can. And so we're looking for the maximum amount of functions uh, that we can get. So when we look at it for just for an example, when we look at a, a digital infrastructure, it's not just about communications. It could be, for example, that one of its key deliverables has also got to be tracking. So th there are quite diverse needs from this hardware. And it's got to have the longest possible life um, to provide the, the most value and return on investment for those of us who are involved in the production of business cases for sign off for investment. Um, clearly, the, the longer period of time that you can have to recover that investment, the more chance you've got of making it a, a profitable exercise. Um, so what we've got here is a need to to uh, provide a long life um, with uh, an eye to the future, um, but put it into an extremely harsh environment. So it's not an insignificant challenge, but conceptually, these are the kind of things that we're looking to achieve. So I've sort of tried to pull out what I see as some of the critical functions uh, that this, this digital infrastructure would need to deliver. Um, and um, sort of looking at uh, maybe say the communication solutions, um, how can it bring together the diverse devices we need to connect to um, and be cost effective at the points it's needed, but be capable of expanding and shrinking as required. Um, so, you know, it's not always about growth. There could be periods or times where you need to uh, bring this um, this solution, and I'm going to call it a solution, uh, down to um, a smaller um, a smaller solution and then expand back out again. So it's not always just about expanding. Um, and be suitable for the mine environment, providing um, obviously as a critical function, the reliability that you need as well. So looking particularly at the first um, aspect of communications, um, communications means different things to different uh, audiences. So there are different communication needs and if we look at the obvious um, ones, the communication between, for example, people and vehicles um, is a very different kind of communication need. So perhaps between vehicles and vehicles or, or people and people, but there are common threads. Uh, so, for example, people may need to talk to each other in different locations, but some of those people will be in vehicles and some won't. So you kind of have these different uh, communication uh, needs, different communication methods, but the expectation is that it can be provided. Um, it can be provided by your digital infrastructure. In a different kind of context for communications, and really I'm talking about how it's a very broad subject, it could be that it's communication um, between systems. 
so in other words, um, it's likely that there will need to be exchange of data between systems and how does that look and what are these protocols um, and how easy is it to interconnect between these systems. Um, or it could be um, communications with a centralized control room uh, with the rest of your operations um, so that decisions made in a control room, for example, can be communicated to people underground. So when we think about communications capabilities, it's again a broad subject that needs to be approached in a, a very holistic way. Again, when we look at connectivity, which was the sort of second point that I felt was important, uh, it, it covers many subject areas and again it needs uh, to be holistically approached um, to include not just uh, wireless technologies which we we focus on it tends to be the focus uh, but also wired technologies so poe plus for example and the proliferation of those kind of wired devices um, uh, along with the typical sort of wireless technologies such as wi-fi so in addition to the sort of traditional connectivity requirements um, of devices and sensors, uh, we also need to consider how we're going to connect people to data uh, and, and different consumers of that data together um, and consider things like emerging technologies such as edge devices, for example. So how do we connect with edge devices uh, which are designed to minimize uh, data on the network by doing processing locally? but still connect into centralized systems to be able to um, deliver the information uh, or the data that they're uh, dealing with um, on the edge. I think when we look at scalability and flexibility, um, it's possibly one of the easier uh, aspects to define when we're looking at what our requirements are, um, but it still requires the same kind of rigor of thought. We need to really uh, consider that in some instances, the digital platform will be expected to be relevant for a large part of the mind's life cycle. And um, this could be either just a very long period in time or it could be um, a fairly rapidly evolving, um, changing in burden uh, of the uh, on the digital infrastructure. And so when we're looking at this, we really need to think about how is how are the needs going to change? Uh, will we need to start small and then be able to rapidly expand? Um, or are we coming into a period of relative stability uh, within what we'd consider to be the life cycle of the equipment? Um, wherever we sit, we need to think about uh, the scalability aspect in these instances. And as I said before, it, it's uh, we know that data needs are unlikely to diminish. Um, so uh, when we look at this, we should also, when we talk about scalability, not just think about the, the particular site that we're thinking about, but how may we have to scale this so that multiple sites can be connected to this digital infrastructure um, and how can this data be visible to others who may have overarching responsibilities for multiple sites. So really scalability can, as we, as I say, can really come down to the simplistic view of the number of years or the, uh, you know, the life of the mine or the life cycle of the mine or, or maybe corporate uh, overarching requirements to be able to consolidate um, these systems together. And of course, when we're looking at um, long service life, again, one of the easier concepts for us to work through. Um, to be cost effective, a platform needs to be designed from the start to operate and be, in, and be installed in a mining environment. Um, not only does this give us the um, potential for, for a long life, uh, but it also makes it um, uh, easier to work with and easier to install. So again, equipment which would be a, a trivial exercise to install above ground uh, becomes more of a challenge when we're in the underground environment. Um, so by designing uh, the equipment from scratch uh, for the underground environment, um, it's easy for us to, as a supplier to be able to achieve longevity. Um, and of course, the longer and harder you can work this investment um, and the more it's available, or in other words, how reliable it is, the easier it is for, to, uh, to justify an investment 
um, and returns can be realized. So when you're going to the management teams to to be able to justify this spend, um, it makes it a much easier job when your your horizons go out. I suppose the question really from my perspective is that when we're looking at longevity, um, how does this work with the opportunity to take advantage of emerging technologies and practices? And I think this is sort of one of the challenges that I really wanted to address here um, is that is this achievable um, or um, are they mutually exclusive? Um, again, going back to the sort of the human aspect of it, um, I think that as our, as our workforces develop, um, the expectations that their, um, their experiences on the surface uh, will impact their expectations in their working. And uh, we know that many of the sort of enablers on the surface um, are limited or unavailable um, underground. So the way that we install equipment is impacted, uh, the way that things work underground is different, and some technologies that we take for granted are limited or, or may not be available. And of course, one of the, just as an obvious one that I think most of us use in our daily lives is, is GPS positioning, for example. So how do we find the best compromises or perhaps plan for the, for the best outcome? Looking at the sort of wireless connectivity aspect, which is obviously one of the key things to uh, when we're, we're looking at these platforms, um, you know, especially when we consider, for example, the automation needs. Um, wireless solutions, we shouldn't forget that wireless solutions need to be underpinned with a high speed, um, high, re high reliability backbone. So I guess that's really a given, and I'm sort of assuming that that's going to be a given as I move forward with this. Um, the, I think that the major deliverables um, of our system are probably covered by our connectivity needs um, and there are a wide range of devices and we need to be able to connect to them without limiting their performance um, or the data needs of the mine. So, you know, when we look at suppliers who are providing this equipment, they will have assumptions uh, in terms of performance um, and they will have needs in terms of basic uh, connectivity performance that we need to be able to meet. Um, and when we're trying to provision for these, we, we really need to consider the needs in terms of voice, um, data, uh, tracking, roaming, all these kind of connectivity issues that need to be addressed by a system with potentially multiple uh, technologies on it. I just wanted to sort of briefly look at um, what these ex existing wireless technologies look like. Um, and I, the reason for looking at this is that I, I, I believe that not, not one technology is actually going to give us the solution that we need, uh, the optimum solution um, underground. And just starting with Wi-Fi, um, which is uh, probably the most widely used technology um, I think that uh, Wi-Fi um, is widely used because it's effective. Um, it's easy to understand because it's been around for a while. Uh, there are a large number of people who understand how to use it. Um, it's got relatively high upload and download speeds. Um, it can connect to a, a large number of peripherals. It's cost effective because it's such a prevalent uh, technology. Uh, there's a lot of um, peripheral equipment that can connect to it. So, for example, uh, when we talk about tracking, um, Wi-Fi chirping uh, tracking tags, for example, are designed specifically to interface. But of course, with the ongoing theme of, of I think what drives us here is that it's a developing protocol. And so, um, you know, at the moment, for example, People probably using Type N um, underground. Uh, Wi-Fi 6 is uh, is being developed um, and and looked at for underground technology, which will bring download speeds into the gigabit uh, range. So it's still a developing technology, despite the fact that it's it's been around for a while um, and is in constant use. If we look at BLE, which is 
perhaps something that people don't consider as a um, a wireless um, a wireless technology. Um, as we all know, it's it's very common uh, above ground. Virtually everything that you've got in your daily life will be um, uh, will be using Bluetooth uh, to connect. Um, and of course, when we consider that, how can we use this in mining? Well, I suppose the one of the obvious things is connectivity for wearables. So if we're looking at the well-being um, and health of people, uh, there's a, a wide range of, uh, of wearables that can measure things like temperature and heart rate. And so how do we get that information about people back into um, our communication systems? And of course, because it's a developing protocol, it's constantly developing because it's driven by uh, commune, uh, uh, by consumer need. Uh, it's developing very fast. And as it's developing, it's becoming, I guess, more grown up when we look at it from a, a, a control perspective. Um, it, um, uh, for example, now with Bluetooth 5, you can start to uh, manipulate uh, data rate and distance ratios. Um, and certainly uh, when you consider not just the pairing capabilities of this, um, but also um, the positioning capability of it, um, then BLE beaconing, for example, is a technology um, which is uh, transferable into the mine environment. So uh, the reason I mention it is that it may not be something that uh, immediately you would consider uh, with um, your communications technologies, uh, but it certainly has applications in a future, I believe anyway, in the underground mining environment. I guess the, the next technology um, that uh, is certainly getting a lot of airspace at the moment is LTE. Um, and um, as Peter mentioned, um, the, you know, they've been exploring uh, and using LTE and of course, everybody knows it's it's very common on the surface. Uh, it's less common underground, and certainly from our perspective, uh, we've uh, we've we've used LTE underground, and um, and we're looking at its characteristics uh, and how it operates in terms of a wireless protocol. Um, one of its benefits, of course, is it provides um, high bandwidths. Um, it is a licensable product, unlike Wi-Fi. Um, the bandwidth, of course, uh, is dependent on distance and transmission power, but it has a very strong voice performance. There's possibly less uh, options for position tracking with it. Um, and I, I think it's fair to say that in the underground environment, um, it's still being understood in, in the way that it, that it works. And again, like all of the technologies that I've mentioned, it's being developed. So, you know, the question is, I guess, like all of these developing technologies, where do I really, uh, where do I really make a choice uh, on which of these um, that we want to we want to actually commit to? The other um, technology that I really wanted to uh, bring to your attention is IoT, and again, maybe you've been considering this in terms of a wireless option for your environment. Um, maybe you haven't, but we certainly have been looking at this, and uh, again, it's one of those very prevalent uh, technologies above ground. Um, you'd probably know it best for, for example, reading smart meters in urban environments where it has the ability to connect to a large number of uh, wireless sensors and monitors. Um, and it's designed, I guess, primarily uh, for low data rates um, over long distances with low power. I think that from from perspective, of course, what this does do is it gives us the opportunity to um, to start thinking about more and more monitoring uh, of the environment using this technology because you don't need to cable to it. Um, LoRa, which is prevalent in above ground in the smart metering environment, does kind of fit our, um, for example, our kind of environments. Um, I think that. Um, the, the other challenge for us perhaps is that the sensors around are, are generally not mine ready, but that development from our perspective anyway, I don't think is particularly difficult to, um, to address. So again, it's a different kind of connectivity requirement to say LTE. Um, it's much broader 
um, it's 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 around a much lower density and a much lower data rate, but it definitely has a place. So I guess in summary, um, what I'm saying is that you know that's just four of the wireless technologies that I really wanted to sort of bring to your attention. Um, and as I said, it needs to really be underpinned by a, uh, underpinned by a fast and secure backbone. I think that's pretty much a given, as I said before. Each of them has got very different characteristics, but there is a common theme, and that common theme is that they're all evolving. None of these are stationary. None of them will just be as they are. They will continue to live up to deliver higher speeds, higher performance, whatever the particular thing that they focus on is. And in an ideal world, I guess, then the obvious thing is that you'd select the most appropriate technology for your applications um, in each area of the mine. But in the real world, which is the one that we actually look in, um, you can approach this if you look at your digital platform. If it's agnostic uh, to wireless technologies, then you can actually take this approach. So it is possible for you to actually move into a particular application or a particular zone. And with a flexible architecture, you can actually put in these uh, differing technologies as they match exactly the needs of that zone or application um, and be able to consolidate them onto one single platform. So I think if I would like to, if I'd like you to have any kind of take out from this is that you should think in this way that these technologies can be thought of uh, as almost application or zone specific and you should be able to facilitate that if you're careful uh, with the solution. I just wanted to touch on the software aspect of it as well because um, the sort of decisions that you'll be looking at uh, in in terms of digital infrastructure and the considerations that you have, you should really be applying those um, same that same kind of rigor um, as you, as you would for your digital infrastructure. So, really, again, to to get the most out of digital infrastructure, then really you need a software solution um, which is sitting on top of that. Um, managing uh, the the data, extracting the data, um, and really fulfilling the need for you to be able to see what's going on in the mine overall. The software really solution can also be shaped to fit your business in just the same way as the uh, as the digital infrastructure can. So you should really be able to scale it uh, in exactly the same way, so that you're not over investing, but on the other hand. Um, you're not also being limited uh, for uh, future developments. It needs to be really be capable of connecting your people um, uh, in the mine to the multitude of devices and systems that you're actually introducing. Um, and you shouldn't also forget that it may need to connect uh, your people to multiple sites. So in that respect, um, you do you do need to really open up um, the full scope of what you're trying to achieve, maybe not just today, but also um, for tomorrow. So again, um, I've just pulled out some things that I think uh, are important to consider um, in the similar sort of vein to our digital infrastructure. The, the software really needs to be able to evolve to take advantage of emerging technologies, but also practices. So as, as we develop best practice in the mine, inevitably it's going to get delivered by software um, interconnecting with the, the digital infrastructure. Uh, and then this is particularly true, uh, for example, on edge devices and, and, you know, we've had discussions, Peter mentioned um, ventilation on demand, for example, and, and ventilation on demand can be delivered effectively through edge devices, but it still needs to be um, integrated with your network and integrated with a central view. Um, and so uh, your software the, the, the needs upon your software can be quite varied if you consider that it's also a portal to um, important operational needs such as ventilation on demand. Of course, the other thing is that data in itself is not much use um, unless it becomes information. 
And there is more, more and more need, as I see, as I talk to our clients, uh, for them to um, enable their employees and supervisors um, to make decisions quickly based on data which is coming in, but also to be able to go back into that data and look for uh, historical analysis. So um, I think one of the key things is recognising that the, the software really should be designed um, for mining. It should allow each user to create their own view, uh, because at the end of the day, um, if it's going to if it's going to blend easily into your operations, then the users of that software need to be able to configure it to show it as little or as much as they want and simplify that decision making. So it should facilitate decision making. It shouldn't inhibit decision making by being too broad um, or unfocused uh, to help. So again, just moving into that sort of summary phase, um, looking at the software perspective of the digital mine, the approach to defining the needs is a very holistic one. Again, it needs to be able to adapt to emerging technologies. And as a requirement to enable people to make decisions grows, then the requirement of our software to convert data into information grows. And of course, really, if for any of you have been involved in data analysis, you often will receive a lot of data um, and realize after a lot of work that it doesn't actually answer the question that you first asked and you need to go back again. So flexibility in being able to uh, pick the data and analyze the data is one of the key things. Essentially, a mine, a mine wide software platform is required to integrate with digital infrastructure. Uh, it really needs to uh, have the, the flexibility and the capability to deep dive into that digital infrastructure because essentially it's the interface with that infrastructure for human beings and actually other systems um, and people and machines and possibly over multiple sites. So it's just a key, just as a key component um, of um, a digital mine as the, as the hardware is. So really, as just pulling this together um, uh, from both a hardware and software perspective, um, the concept of scalability and reliability of digital solutions um, should consider both digital hardware and the overarching software that brings it to life. Focusing on a particular technology applies constraints, which, which frankly is unnecessary if the platform is flexible enough. I would hate to be in a position where I had to, uh, as an engineer, define uh, the, that a mine used on a single basis um, when things are changing so, so fast. And so you can de-stress that decision by, um, by forgetting the technology, looking at the platform and focusing on the applications and the zones. So really, I'm, I'm suggesting take that big picture approach and identify the business needs, and that will give you clarity on your decision making. If we take the view that technology evolves over the life of the system, then we can plan for it. If we're expecting that evolution, then it won't be a surprise to us. And as these new technologies actually emerge, they can truly be taken as an opportunity um, and not as a missed opportunity. OK, so thank you. Thank you for your time, everybody. Um, as uh, Marcus said, there's an opportunity for questions. Uh, these are my contact details. If you've got anything that occurs to you um, after the meeting, um, I'm based in Brisbane, Australia. Uh, so um, take that into account if you choose to call. Uh, but um, yep, that's the end of my presentation. All right, thank you very much, Mark. Really appreciate that. We do have one question from Nicolette Baker that says, what's the greatest challenge for technology providers in getting adoption across mining operators of an open source platform or solution? Um, I suppose the, the challenge is probably around um, communicating uh, the, is, is communicating your needs basically. Um, really for, for us as a supplier to understand um, 
to understand what your challenge is and to make recommendations on how we can we can provide that. Um, it's about people sharing what their problems are and about us sharing what the technologies are. So really, I suppose it's it's turning these concepts into the sort of real use cases that the mine has today and then us applying to that um, our future view of um, those technologies. So I guess one of the major challenges is really is is um, is establishing a trust in a relationship where we can really explore uh, what the needs um, uh, of our customers are going to be. Um, and uh, also um, being able to create an environment where we can encourage people to have this bigger and more holistic view. Um, so I guess the challenge really is to accepting that there is a challenge in this opportunity um, and that uh, we take the time to really um, explore it fully. And there's one final question, which is, it's maybe more of a statement, so I'll, I'll try to rephrase it, but it's a question from Alvaro Rosso, and it's about uh, Laura versus Myoti. And so I think the question would be, as you mentioned, Laura, but have what, what are your thoughts about Myoti or other LP WAM technologies? I suppose really, to be perfectly honest, um, Laura is really the only technology that um, I've personally explored, so I can only really comment on that at the moment. I think that um, when we when we look at these technologies, Laura seems to meet to me to my mind the um, the needs of being able to connect to sensors and to read those sensors uh, in a controlled way. So, in other words. Um, it's unlikely that you would connect to LoRa, for example, um, for high-speed communications and constant data, data reading. But it's a, an ideal um, it's an ideal solution to be reading environmental conditions, uh, which are not perhaps rapidly changing. Um, I suppose that to sort of answer the question in a slightly different way. Our focus or my focus is not around a technology solution, but a, a technology platform. So the way that we address this um, at MST is, is by providing uh, wireless um, edge devices onto which we can build these servers. So, for example, we will we will run a, a LoRa server on an edge device and then connect to it through um, our Helix platform. If we find a technology that's more appropriate, then we it's simply for us a, it's simply for us a server exercise on the edge device, and we will write uh, we'll write a new server and and start to roll out that protocol. So it's it's an emerging thing for us. Um, we've simply looked at LoRa because um, initially there seems to be above the surface, uh, a wide acceptance of it. Um, we have started to see it emerging uh, underground in very, very limited way. Uh, but what we're actually seeing is a requirement to be able to connect to wireless, a broad range and a high number of wireless sensors underground. So unfortunately, I'm not in a position to give you a critical feedback on the, uh, the different protocols. I can sort of give you our position from a technology development perspective. 